Hello, my name is Jonathan Myrena, and we'll be presenting on injectable biomaterials following stroke. Our article was published in Nature Materials the 21st of May 2018, and its title is Dual Function Injectable Angiogenic Biomaterials for the Repair of Brain Tissue Following Stroke. To understand our article, it's best to understand stroke itself. There are two types of stroke, ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke is caused by a blood clot and doesn't let oxygen flow to one area of the brain, often leading to the death of the tissue. Hemorrhagic stroke is caused by blood spilling into the brain. Ischemic stroke is treated by having a medicine which destroys the clot. The medicine is often a tissue plasmogen activator. Hemorrhagic stroke is treated by an emergency surgery. This emergency surgery can be used to reduce bleeding and take the blood out of the brain. What's important to note is that the recovery time after stroke is different for everyone. It can take weeks, months, or even years. Some people recover fully, but others have long-term or lifelong disabilities. This can include loss of speech, loss of movement, and other complications. Early intervention by occupational and physical therapists is very helpful for patients who have just experienced a stroke. These professionals can teach people how to work around new disabilities and regain strength after brain injury. Usually after hospitalization, people live in rehabilitation centers where additional intensive therapy may be provided. The goal of rehabilitation is to help the patient recover as much physical and speaking function as possible. On the right, you can see a speech therapist helping a patient recover their speech. They teach them techniques on how to move their tongue and practice moving their jaw. This process is long and difficult. Now, biomaterialists and other researchers are trying to solve this. The aim of the article that we chose to analyze is to lay the groundwork for the use of any biomaterial as a treatment for brain recovery after stroke. Its hypothesis is that after a hydrogel HA is injected into the stroke cavity, it will first off be compatible and not affect the stroke cavity negatively, and secondly, that it will reduce scar tissue and increase brain tissue regeneration and the rate of its regeneration over time. Hello, this is Amy. The authors of this paper identified a growth factor called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, that's associated with angiogenesis and axonogenesis, but also with neurological defects due to greater opening in the blood-brain barrier. Knowing this, they wanted to modify VEGF to reduce inflammation, stimulate angiogenesis and axonogenesis, and introduce a scaffold to act as a physical support for a new neuronal network in the brain following a stroke. We will discuss the results of this proposed solution a little later, but we are first going to focus on the techniques that were used in order to create this biomaterial. Knowing what they did about VEGF, they combined it with a scaffold that also promotes regeneration in the brain. The scaffold was made of hyaluronic acid and was treated with various combinations of VEGF to examine the effect on angiogenesis and exonogenesis in mice. They used six main combinations of scaffold and gel. The first was no gel, which had no treatment. That was the control. The second was another control, which was an empty gel with no treatment factor VEGF. The last four treatments had heparin nanoparticles in them. Heparin is typically used to reduce blood clotting, but in this case, it's going to be used to bind the VEGF to the scaffold. So these four treatments were gel plus the heparin nanoparticles, which is just the clotting factor, no VEGF, gel plus VS, which is soluble VEGF nanoparticles, gel plus low cluster VEGF nanoparticles, and then gel plus high cluster VEGF nanoparticles. Okay, and as I said before, heparin is typically used to reduce blood clotting, but again will be used to bind the VEGF to the scaffold. To do this, they used radical polymerization reaction to modify the heparin with P-azidobenzyl hydrazide and N3-aminopropyl methacrylamide. Um, this was combined at various concentrations to form different packing densities. So they got the low concentration VEGF, which is LCV, and high concentration VEGF, which is HCV, and then the soluble VEGF as well. Then they double checked the results using an ELISA, and then to triple check the results, they used the dot plot test to make sure that VEGF was bound on the surface of their scaffold. Another major technique used was the cell proliferation assay, which was used to determine if angiogenesis and exonogenesis was occurring and which packing method of VEGF was most effective in promoting this growth. 
So to do this assay, cells were grown in media for four hours and exposed to various cluster densities of VEGF and compared to the negative control with no VEGF and then no scaffold as well. The cells were cultured for two days and then they were lysed and the relative fluorescence was measured and the more fluorescence they had, the more dead cells there were, which meant that there was more growth in those uh, samples. Hello, this is Maria Vando, and I want to go over the results of this experiment. I want to start off by restating the question that the experiment was trying to solve. The question is, if injecting a therapeutic angiogenic material that was compromised of vascular endothelial growth factor to the stroke cavity would encourage angiogenesis and support tissue repair post-stroke. The formulations that were made were tested, and one of the formulations did in fact show that a hydrogel biomaterial that was composed of vascular endothelial growth factor would in fact promote regeneration of vascular and neuronal structures within the stroke cavity. The rats in this experiment showed behavioral improvements once the formulation was directly injected into the stroke cavity. I will also be going over the specific formulations that had the most promising results for this experiment. On this slide, I will be going over two formulations. First, heparin nanoparticles with no VEGF, and second, low cluster VEGF with heparin nanoparticles. They were analyzed at the 2 and 16 weeks mark post-stroke. They had the following results. No vascular or axonal growth no changes to the microglial inflammation, and no changes in scar thickness. As we can see in figure 4, GLU-1 was used to measure vascular density in both infarct and peri-infarct areas of the cavity. As we can see, there were no statistically significant changes to the cavity in this section. In figure 5, we can see that NF200 was used to measure the axonal area over time. We can also see that these formulations had no significant changes during that time period. We can conclude that VEGF and naked particles alone do not promote healing, but require the influences of heparin particles. On this slide, I will be going over the most promising formulation of this experiment, which was the high cluster VEGF with heparin nanoparticles. This formulation showed a significant increase of neurofilaments within the cavity. Figure 6 can help us see that NF200 was used again to measure the infarct and peri-infarct areas of the cavity and that this formulation was a statistical improvement over the other formulations. There was also an association that was found between vessels and neurofilaments in this formulation that can help us conclude that vessels have an important role in axogenesis within the stroke cavity. Lastly, behavioral improvements of the rats were measured through different physical tests. One of the tests was the cylinder, and this showed a significant increase in the contralateral forelimb areas of the rat. The grid test was used and it showed that there was a significant decrease in the number of contralateral foot faults. Hello, I'm Fabian Colón, and I will be speaking with respect to the discussion and overall thoughts we had regarding this study. So, now that we have seen that this treatment can in fact regenerate new brain tissue, including the creation of new neuronal networks in what was just inactive brain scar following a stroke, one question arises. What's next? Well, we know from the study that the mice that received the treatment had an improved ability to reach for food, which implied improved motor functions. However, it is still unclear as to whether this improvement in motor functions was a direct result of the newly regenerated brain tissue or if this new tissue simply improved the performance of the brain tissue surrounding it. From here, it would be important to see if the same method could be enhanced and, as a result, be used to treat mice that had suffered more severe effects such as full paralysis. If questions such as these are answered, then perhaps it is possible to move one step closer to the ultimate goal. To use this or a similar treatment in humans who have suffered from stroke and attain results close to or possibly even better than the ones achieved in this study. Now, regarding alternative methods, there are currently many types of ongoing trials and studies that aim to find better treatment for patients that have suffered from stroke. Two of those are albumin in acute ischemic stroke, or alias, and antihypertensive treatment of acute cerebral hemorrhage, or attached to. 
The former is studying the use of albumin, a protein found in plasma blood believed to have neuroprotective properties in patients that have recently suffered from an acute ischemic stroke, while the latter is attempting to see whether intensive blood pressure management can be used to reduce the size and rate of a hemorrhage in patients that have suffered from an intracerebral hemorrhage. Both of these studies, however, seem to try to minimize as much as possible the dangerous and possibly fatal effects of a stroke, whereas the one being presented today seeks to heal areas of the brain that have suffered from stroke. Regardless, all three of these studies or trials share one variable, which in reality is more of a limitation. This limitation is the fact that the treatment was administered to the mice that had just recently suffered from stroke, specifically five days afterwards. According to the World Stroke Organization, approximately 15 million people around the world experience a stroke each year, and from those, about 5.8 million people die. Another important step for this study would be to see whether or not this method, or one similar to it, can be used for the millions of people that have already experienced a stroke years or maybe even decades ago, as well as the millions of people that will suffer from a stroke from now to the time where these treatments will actually be available to the public. For now, we believe this treatment seems to only be useful to treat people who have very recently suffered from a stroke, although this will most likely change in the near future. Another important aspect we realize should be considered is that the effects of a stroke depend largely on the size and location of the stroke, with stroke happening in parts of the brain that receive the largest amounts of blood being most likely to result in death. These facts lead us to believe that there are certain types of strokes that would require faster and more effective versions of this treatment, or maybe a new treatment altogether, in order to deal with these more demanding cases. Although it may seem that this study produces more questions than it answers, we all acknowledge that its results are still groundbreaking, and they give us a glimpse into a future where perhaps stroke is no longer as threatening or significantly life-altering as it currently is.